Hey, Mark here again, and we are continuing in our series on residual energy and haunts. Last time we did uh, mainly just an introduction, and um, we introduced some of the basic issues and concepts, uh, why it's so significant, and, and so forth. And tonight we will for really get into the, the, the meat of, uh, of it. And as we proceed, I'm going to keep a running list of, of what I consider problems associated with the current notion of residual energy, red flags, if you will. See, my case is cumulative, and that's important for you to keep in mind, okay? So I'm going to keep before us a growing number of problems and complexity uh, with reference to this. To me, it's kind of similar to what happened to the Ptolemaic system regarding the solar system. There were so many anomalies that began to uh, occur that um, they couldn't be ignored anymore by the scientists until it came to the point where it just had to be jettisoned uh, for the uh, Copernican system. And to me, it's time to reject the notion of residual energy because it's just too cumbersome. There's too many anomalies and um, Occam's razor is something that I'm going to be appealing to a lot, and that states that the simplest explanation that explains the phenomena is to be preferred. Um, and I do seeing that, see this as a stronghold, and I'm, I'm going to treat it as such, which means that I, I need to try, by God's grace, to tear it down. So here are some of the, the highlights from last segment in which... Um, some of the problems that were brought up. Jeff Bellinger um, from Ghost Village, uh, one of the leading folks in the paranormal community, he asserted that the vast majority of the data uh, does not support the theory of residual energy as it's currently understood. Most residual energy uh, phenomena is of mundane activity, not traumatic events uh, causing diffusion of energy into the environment, as the theory states. Now this alone is huge um, and should cause one to sit up straight and take notice because this is one of you know paranormal community's own leaders asserting that the theory does not correspond to hard-nosed reality. It, it does not explain uh, the phenomena, or at least not most of it. Um, again, these are just some of the red flags I want to keep before us. Um, he also stated that we can't get rid of residual energy because it's non-intelligent unless, he says, you treated it as if it was demonic. Um, now, what does that suggest to you? It is demonic. Um, that's what it suggests to me. Thirdly, um, I had mentioned that folks in their attempts to support this theory appeal to the supernatural. Um, but we need to remember that, like gravity, uh, residual energy is um, something that's a, allegedly a, a natural phenomenon, totally. So appeals to supernatural or fallacious reasoning. Um, fourthly, it was pointed out in the last segment that, and this is devastating, there is no known mechanism to explain the residual energy haunts. And to me, this is similar to the problem with macroevolution. Um, and I'm going to be relentless in keeping before us uh, these red flags. And if you're open-minded, these issues should raise some doubts, at least concerns. If not, um, then I just wonder if we're really being open-minded and, and humbly teachable, uh, which is something that we all should be. Um, now I raise perhaps the biggest red flag of all tonight and what I want to uh, focus on tonight and that has to do with thermodynamics. Uh, in this segment I want to focus on how the concept of residual energy or haunt is contradictory to science. Uh, general revelation versus special revelation. God, Both of them are, are God's word. In particular, how is it contrary to the law of thermodynamics, this thing, uh, notion of residual energy? Um, this will be an argument from science and not explicitly from the Bible, but all truth is God's truth, and the laws of science are God's laws. 
And as we'll see, only a non-biblical worldview could give rise to a notion that gives energy such a central role in explaining reality. Okay, that I'm appealing to thermodynamics may surprise some of you because oftentimes folks will appeal to the first law of thermodynamics, the law of energy conservation, in support of either intelligent ghosts or residual haunts. The argument goes like this, since energy cannot be created or destroyed, then when people die or there's a traumatic event dispersing emotional energy, then their energy has to go somewhere, right? Well, with what I consider several steps of logic missing in between, the conclusion is then made that this provides a scientific basis for intelligent haunts as well as residual haunts. Now, regarding residual haunts, it's stated that the, the first law, conservation, also can explain why these alleged non-intelligent haunts can morph and move so remarkably. It's simply energy changing its form and on certain cues. However, we have to remember that there are three laws of thermodynamics, or some will say four, but these are the most applicable to our discussion. And the second and third laws are in partic particularly overlooked in this discussion. The second law of ther thermodynamics deals with entropy of energy. Energy is, is unstable and experiences entropy until thermal equilibrium has been reached, the third law. This law explains why perpetual motion machines are impossible in the world God has created. All scientific laws like gravity and thermodynamics have been woven by the Logos, Jesus, into the fabric of his universe, ensuring that the cosmos coheres, works, and that, that it is habitable and discoverable. Now, to help explain how the second and third laws work, consider what would happen if you took a glass of water and put, put several drops of green food coloring in it. Okay, let me do that right now, right in front of you. This a glass of water. I'm gonna put just one drop in, hopefully. Okay, now I'm gonna gently put it right next to me and hopefully not knock it over with my elbow. Okay, it's just sitting there. Now I'll return to it in just a minute. All right. Now, immediately, and I'll show this in, in a few minutes, the green drops will begin to disperse without agitating. You saw, I, I didn't agitate, I didn't stir it. The contents. This dispersion will continue until the green food coloring has reached equilibrium. It has been evenly distributed throughout the container, the glass. In the end, you will have light green water evenly distributed throughout the water. Again, all this occurs without shaking or stirring the glass. As you can see, I, my hands are right here. My, oh, by the way, my fingers are green from, from practicing this. <laughs> uh, so, um, in like fashion, consider what happens when someone dies or there's a traumatic event. When energy has been released from its container, you know, the body, whether it's bioelectric energy from the human body or alleged emotional psychic trauma energy, then it will begin to disperse immediately until it has reached equilibrium in the surrounding environment. Now that's presupposing that there is any energy to disperse at death, which I think is doubtful. We'll talk more about that later. Though the energy has not been destroyed, the first law, it has been very significantly watered down due to being widely distributed or diffused in the environment. Hence, it is rendered unusable because the energy has been reduced to nothing. It's not destroyed, but it is nothing in the sense that it has become so entirely dispersed into the surrounding atmosphere. It is so thoroughly watered down that it retains none of its original distinctive features or potential energy. Okay? Now, as opposed to the glass, when someone 
loses the, the energy, it goes into the environment, and that is a huge glass. So whatever little energy is gone, it's dispersed into a, a huge container. See, nothing, uh, nothing cannot cause something. There's a Latin phrase, ex nihilo nihil fit, from nothing, nothing comes. For nothing to cause something, it has to be and not be at the same time in the same relationship. And if there's no remaining energy due to entropy, then it cannot be the cause of anything. Not to mention the elaborate demonstrations associated with residual haunts. No residual energy means no residual haunts. Now I want to raise this glass and show, show it to you now. You see? I haven't shaken a bit and the green food color I just put one drop in there and you'll notice that it's not clustered in the middle I didn't shake it like I said it of its the way God has created his universe uh, reality um, similar to food coloring when I put it in there it just um, d evenly dispersed throughout the glass as you can see it's still dispersing, but it's pretty well dispersed and uh, moving in that direction. But the same thing is true with energy. If it's true with this glass of water, again, if if energy is released into an environment, think of how huge um, and how much that would water down what little bit of voltage if there's any really when someone dies but the point is that that's this is just you know a helpful way of showing uh, some of us are visually minded and hopefully that helped to illustrate the um, principle of diffusion the second and the third laws um, just as it would be impossible for the food coloring to stay clustered in the center of the glass See, that would be ridiculous. What if I put that one drop in there and that drop just stayed in the middle? We'd all shake our heads and say, there's something wrong with that water, uh, you know? Um, unless it was acted up upon by an outside agent, that food coloring is, is, is going to disperse. So it, so it would be impossible for least energy to remain clustered somewhere in the environment as the notion of the residual energy requires and assumes. Now try to picture in your mind dropping some green food coloring in a clear glass of water like we just did and the drops clustering tightly together in the center of the glass. Would that look bizarre to you? It should, but that is precisely what the residual energy theory envisions when it asserts that energy stays clustered in the environment. Place memory another term for this, is oxymoronic in light of the principle of thermodynamics because it assumes that an inanimate object has, quote, memory of clustered energy when it takes consciousness to have a memory and when, in fact, this energy has dissipated like the early morning fog or the green food coloring. There is no recording surface to take a picture of this memory and no read-write head, as mentioned uh, in the uh, quote that uh, we mentioned last uh, last segment. Now, it is vital to note at this point that the laws of thermodynamics are considered by scientists to be absolute. Um, there are no known exceptions. You know, the laws of motion. Some people think, at least theoretically, there can there are um, some exceptions. But when it comes to ther thermodynamics, they are absolute. Um, the second law is considered to hold true across the board regardless of circumstances. See, this is important to keep in mind, especially if one simply dismisses my argument by saying, quote, well, the paranormal realm is full of mystery and energy and acts differently in that realm. A thousand times no! See, that kind of logic is known as special pleading, and it's a logical fallacy, and besides, Investigators in the paranormal community have said that residual energy or haunts is not a paranormal phenomenon, but rather a natural phenomenon. Hence, since it is a natural phenomenon, it must follow the laws of nature. 
Also, energy is energy is energy is energy, y'all. Paranormal investigators quantify paranormal energy all the time via EMF gauges, etc. So why question an absolute law of science at this juncture in which it is said to be merely naturally caused energy? So consider this scenario. In my hometown of Greensboro, North Carolina, there was a very bloody battle during the War for Independence, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse in 1781. It is also where I had my first paranormal experience. I saw a shadow figure decked out in military garb of that era, and I rebuked it in the name of Jesus, and it fled. Now, many consider battlefields like Gettysburg to be the classic example of a perfect conditions for the creation of residual energy or haunt. Why is that? Well, the violent and premature deaths or fashion in which these young men um, died um, is said to, to do two things. It, uh, it violently and with high emotional tension releases the bioelectric energy of these young men as they die and it creates emotional or psychic shock waves due to the violence involved. Memories are then imprinted in the environment. That is, all this emotionally charged energy is then absorbed in the surrounding environment in this case, it would have to be the soil beneath their feet, the trees, and the air around them because there's nothing else to be absorbed into. Uh, by the way, this, this um, park is 100 yards away from me, so um, I'm, I'm there all the time. And it's, uh, you know, there's, that's, that's all there is, it's just trees, and, and the main battle happened in, in a, um, uh, uh, an open field. But if you... Take, if you take an insane insi asylum in which there is, is there was uh, usually so much inhumanity, cruelty, and despair, suicide, murders, etc., um, the walls of the asylum, especially if they're made of lines, limestone, are said to be the recipients and the storage receptacles of this released emotional energy. Now, certain cues are then said to cause the stored emotional energy to replay the event. Now, whether it be a scream, footsteps, gunshots, certain smells, or moving apparitions, and so on. And may I interject that it's no wonder that insane asylums are especially known as haunted, because I'm convinced that many folks in insane asylums are possessed. Not all of them, no. Um, due to the fall, some people are just terribly broken psychically. But I'm sure many of you would agree with me that, that a lot of the bad cases are really due to possession. So it's no wonder that there is a lot of um, odd activity going on, but it's not due to residual energy, I know. I do not want to diminish in the least the reality of these horrific events and the deep emotional despair that they've caused. But consider how this scenario flies in the face of what we said above regarding the dispersion of energy and what we saw in this glass. See, it's totally gone. I haven't shaken it at all, and it is totally dispersed. Um, the release of the energy hits the soil or the interior walls if you're in a building, and then, so, being hypothetical here, suppose further it even penetrates the soil or the walls. The alleged result is a cluster, cluster of energy that remains intact indefinitely and provides the basis for resi residual paranormal looking activity. A cluster of energy that is sufficient enough to cause all manner of extraordinary activity like multiple soldiers moving about, sounds of gun and cannon fire, screams of the wounded, and the smell of gunpowder. All of that is allegedly caused by the impersonal forces of energy which have been imprinted indefinitely upon the environment and are playing over and over again. Now, this is where the residual theory slams head first into an absolute law of science. Any energy that was emitted by this traumatic event must immediately begin to disperse until equilibrium has been reached. 
and that the energy is virtually nothing due to how comprehensively it has been watered down. If you think that's watered down, think about what would be watered down in the environment because of how huge our atmosphere is. And the energy is virtually nothing due to how comprehensively it's been watered down. This is entropy, entropy until equilibrium has been reached. Like the green drops in the glass of water, the alleged released energy must be unclustered and watered down until virtually no energy remains. But unlike the glass of water, the new container is much, much larger. The soil, the air, the walls, mainly the atmosphere, air, because it should never reach the walls, the energy that is. Meaning that the release of the alleged traumatic emotionalized energy will experience massive entropy or dispersion immediately into the air, losing any and all alleged ability to perform any functions. There is no energy remaining, kinetic or potential, so how can it do anything? Let me say it another way. The explanation for residual haunts contradicts one of the most absolute, there is no known exceptions, uh, laws of science of nature. Now, Without the energy remaining clusterized indefinitely, then the whole foundation for the residual energy haunt collapses and the entire superstructure with it. But if I've learned anything about human nature, we are loath to abandon beliefs we've come to cherish, even if they, there is considerable evidence against it. You may recall the resistance to the changing of the Earth-centered solar system to a heliocentric. It took a paradigm change, which is a painful process. Sociologists refer to the paranormal community as a plausibility structure. It's much easier to hold on to otherwise implausible beliefs if you have a community of folks who support each other, making it easier to believe certain things and harder to discard them due to peer support or pressure. It is a structured community that enables the implausible to sound plausible within a community of the like-minded. Plausibility structures like the uh, paranormal community, not to mention sinful human nature and Satan, can blind even the most intelligent to otherwise utterly, utterly obvious. See, this notion of intelli uh, residual energy, honestly, to an outsider sounds utterly absurd, implausible, even insane, as some people have, have said to me. Um, it, I, I don't mean to be making fun of it. I'm just talking what I... Um, observations and, and, and so on. Unless there is an exterior force acting upon the alleged released energy created by the violent death events or deaths, then the clusters of energy will immediately experience entropy. The same holds true are the walls of the penitentiary and asylum, whether it is limestone, quartz, or whatever, it makes no difference. See, limestone does have some interesting properties, but and we'll look at that more in detail in another segment, but, but none of these are able to conquer or circumvent thermodynamics. The way some folks talk, you would think that inanimate matter, like walls, have, uh, have assumed human characteristics. The walls do not, quote, witness or remember anything, nor are the, the recording devices, which, are, which, by the way, are intelligently designed by people, um, because it is inanimate matter or air. See, once again, no matter how much violent energy has been released within those walls, in every case, the alleged energy must have dispersed immediately. It makes no difference if it's quartz or whatever. Um, energy may conduct better through some material, but it cannot be stored there indefinitely. The piezoelectric properties of quartz is fascinating, but they provide nothing that can, can circumvent entropy nor provide a mechanism for the whole alleged process. And why would the energy make a beeline for the walls when the tiny amount of bioelectrical energy will most likely diffuse into the air? One would think that these walls not only have photographic memories, but act as uh, energy magnets as well. Whether quartz 
where water helps to accelerate paranormal activity is not the issue here. The issue is whether any substance can retain energy in clustered form and evade entropy. And the answer to that is an emphatic no. Don't let distinct issues confuse the issue at hand, please. Remember, this is said to not be a paranormal issue. I have to keep reminding us of that. Consider the most powerful display of release of energy in nature, lightning. When it hits an object, how long does it take that object to remain energized? How long does the energy remain clustered in that tree? If lightning hits a tree in your backyard, a second after the strike, this massive amount of energy has virtually disappeared in the environment. The air may be ionized briefly, but the object struck is safe to touch a second or two after it's been hit. You can touch the tree and not be shocked. Now compare this lightning strike with the relatively tiny amount of energy allegedly released during a traumatic death. If, now if there is any release of energy, it is gone immediately, the victim of entropy. If it happens so quickly with lightning, then how much more so with the tiny amount of electrical, chemical, thermal energy in the human body? But when a person dies, and this is vital, the energy or electrical activity of the heart and brain ceases. So in reality, when a person dies, there may no, be no electrical energy you know, to disperse. Let's talk about death for a moment. At death, the Bible says that there is a separation of the soul from the body. Death is defined as the ripping asunder of the soul from the body. God owns our souls as well as our bodies. Ezekiel 18. The soul goes immediately before God for judgment, Hebrews 9.27, and many other texts. In addition, the soul is indivisible, which means that pieces of it are not going to break off and remain as so many people seem to assume. Um, how often have you heard folks speak of a piece of a person is remaining or at a location? That's impossible according to biblical categories. The soul is the essence of a person. It is eternal and indivisible. At death, the soul departs from the body entirely intact and stands before God for judgment. Do you really think that God, the holy judge of heaven and earth, will let 5% of our souls to remain and evade his eternal sentence? The fracturing or disintegration of our souls after death is impossible. In light of all God says about himself, ourselves, death, and eternal judgment. Somebody um, with a mind towards psycholo the psychologizing of the paranormal made this insane concept up, I'm afraid. Since the soul and the afterlife are, life are clearly theological matters which science is not equipped to analyze, and why does the paranormal community approach both of these matters in an autonomous fashion by ignoring God's word on the soul and the afterlife. Do you think it's wise to formulate theories about energy and reality without reference to the creator of energy and reality? Uh, I don't think so. Now remember, energy is energy is energy. And we need to stop anthropomorphizing it, that is, giving it human or personal traits. Unless you create a different category of energy unknown to science, then this energy must be inanimate and obey the laws of entropy and quickly diffuse into equilibrium. Nobody has yet to explain how residual energy can evade the absolute laws of thermodynamics. Indeed, they cannot. Advances in science will provide fruitless in searching for a suitable mechanism because of this insurmountable obstacle of thermodynamics. And residual energy has created unnecessary complicatedness in light of the Bible's simple, simple symmetry regarding the afterlife. And the one thing I'm going to argue in, in um, future segments is um, with regards to Occam's razor, the simplicity, not simplisticness, but the simplicity, the simplicity of the biblical view as opposed to the growing 
complexity of, of what we're seeing um, with regards to residual energy. The only thing that I would reiterate is that entropy of released energy is immediate and quick, much quicker than the food coloring analogy that I showed you right here. You know, science tells us that the foundation for the theory of residual energy haunt is contradictory to an absolute law of science. Energy cannot be destroyed, but it also cannot remain clustered no matter what the substance or the circumstances. Period. Thank you for your time. And, and uh, next segment, we're going to look at um, what I'm calling residual haunts and six forms of energy. Thank you. Yeah.